Hey guys, it's Nick again, host of 4Player Podcast and general lover of video games, and it's time once again to declare my 10 favorite games of the year. 2021 was a strange year for me, but it was one of the toughest lists I've had to put together. Let's take a look. So I had a lot of games vying for my number 10 spot this year, and it cut down to my very soul having to exclude so many great games from this list. Our buddy Jeff actually made me realize this year that I'm more often steered by how games make me feel rather than how they are constructed or how complex their systems are. With that in mind, I just couldn't let myself exclude Death's Door from this list. That's not to say it's a poorly constructed game, in fact it's quite the opposite, but it's a game that I cherish because of how cozy it was, a factor that certainly holds a lot of sway in 2021. I mean, come on. It's a clear and worthy homage to classic Zelda games, which lends to the cozy factor in and of itself. You play as a reaper in the form of a crow who embarks on a quest to unravel a bureaucratic conspiracy involving the disappearance of other reapers and the imprisonment of death himself. It's a fun setup that I just managed to make sound way darker than it actually is, but it's the clean isometric presentation, soothing and unforgettable soundtrack, and clever writing that make this game such an obvious choice for me. On top of that, it just happens to play with the finely tuned simplicity of a good Zelda game as well. Combat is a combination of snappy dodge rolls, sword slashes, and carefully timed ranged magic abilities. As an acid nerve game, it features a bow and arrow that is very reminiscent of their last game, Titan Souls, a game that also made my list back in 2015. Outside of combat, you're given free range to explore a semi-open, interconnected world to find secrets and side quests. While its story and dungeon order are linear, the open environments that connect all the dungeons give it the illusion of freedom that it needed to break onto my list. When you look at the big picture, Death's Door may not be remembered for being the best at any one thing. Like their last game, it evokes a certain amount of nostalgia for games that came before, but it wins in my heart because of its style. In a lot of ways, it feels like Zelda by way of Miyazaki. It's packed with humor, secrets, and puzzles in a world that feels very reminiscent of something like Spirited Away and I can't think of higher praise than that. It's a video game suit for the soul, and perhaps more importantly, it's exactly what I needed in a year like 2021. Okay, so it feels weird putting a new Resident Evil game this low on my list. Usually it's either in or near my top spot, or not on my list at all. I have such a turbulent relationship with this franchise because it has rejected the status quo for as long as I can remember. With each core entry, you never really know what you're going to get. On paper, Resident Evil Village sounds like a no-brainer for me. It's the direct follow-up to my 2017 game of the year, and it once again relies on photorealistic environments, terrifying audio design, and resource scarcity to create an unbelievably tense game. With all that said, the experience did end up being quite a bit different than I was expecting, but at the end of the day, I still enjoyed it immensely. First, I gotta give them props for once again straddling the line between classic Resident Evil gameplay and subject matter that feels completely fresh. It may take place in a snowy village nestled in the mountains, but it somehow still feels firmly rooted in the game design philosophy of the original. And by that I mean you're still traversing an open environment to collect key items and solve obscure puzzles that give you access to new zones, and by extension, bring you face to face with a very colorful cast of characters and horrific monsters. It's a tried and true formula that I still absolutely adore. Anyone who listens to our show knows that I have mixed emotions when it comes to the beloved Resident Evil 4. I only bring this up because Village excels in finding the perfect middle ground for someone like me. At the end of the day, it feels like a love letter to both design ideologies by embracing the slower, more methodical pacing mo moment to moment while delivering on the sheer variety and craziness that made Resident Evil 4 an instant classic. The village itself is a wagon wheel design of sorts with spokes that branch off to four very different areas that each embrace a unique concept with new characters, different enemy types, and a distinct brand of batshit insanity. The end result is a game that encourages exploration on a bigger scale than anything that came before, while also delivering on that sense of discovery that made you excited and nervous, opening every door in the Spencer Mansion back in the original. The things that hold this game back for me are some general issues with the combat, I do think it feels a bit sluggish for a game that is often throwing hordes of fast-moving werewolves at you, and my usual distaste for some of the more over-the-top elements of the story. But despite those things, 
Resident Evil Village remains a triumph for this beloved franchise and once again makes me hopeful for the future. If the past two games are any indication, Resident Evil 9 is poised to once again redefine the series, and that kind of reputation alone is reason enough to honor it on this list. So, I played the cult classic Psychonauts for the very first time in 2021. As a fan of Double Fine, it's pretty shocking to me that I somehow managed to pass this one up, especially with Brad ringing its praises for so long, but better late than never, I suppose. It actually worked out though, because I was able to finally experience its charms and then roll right into the highly anticipated Psychonauts 2, a game that is, for all intents and purposes, a more refined and modern feeling game that hasn't sacrificed one iota of its charm and insanity. Raz's story picks up right where it left off as he continues on his journey to becoming a bona fide Psychonaut. Of course, the Psychonauts are a secretive government agency that trains psychic agents, <coughs> children, to save the world from other psychic threats. Again, I've managed to make a hilarious, lighthearted affair sound way darker than it actually is, but I think the footage you're watching speaks for itself. This game is unabashedly vibrant and silly. Raz has gone from the Psychonauts summer camp to interning at the actual Psychonauts facility where he uncovers a mystery that takes him gallivanting around the, the inside of the minds of the very people responsible for birthing the organization. But what I love about Psychonauts 2 is how it refines the platforming and traversal mechanics of the original. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of classic platformers from the PS2 era like Jack and Daxter. It features a small hub world that is densely packed with fun platforming opportunities and a wealth of Double Fine's hilarious writing that had me smiling ear to ear everywhere I went. While the levels, quote unquote, themselves are wonderfully creative, some of my fondest memories of the game are from exploring the Psychonauts compound and talking with all the kooky characters that populate it. But of course, Psychonauts is known for its wildly diverse level design and the sequel delivers in spades. From horrifying dental nightmares to elaborate game shows about cooking, walking, and talking food items to navigating a psychedelic music festival, this game goes to some truly unforgettable places, letting you explore and wreak havoc with psychic powers like telekinesis, levitation, and clairvoyance. While I wouldn't describe anything this game does as groundbreaking, it recontextualizes so many common mechanics in such an uncommon space that it can't help but stand out from the crowd. Hopefully, with the help of Game Pass and the cult popularity of the original, this sequel will become a bit more mainstream this time around. It certainly deserves it. As a big fan of horror games, few games have unsettled me in the same way as Mundan. This indie horror game from Swiss developer Hidden Fields takes inspiration from European folklore, delivering a distinct, hand-drawn tale in the harsh sunlight of the Swiss Alps. You play as a man named Curden, who returns to his grandfather's little village in the mountains after he tragically perishes in a fire. When you arrive, you find that your grandfather's corpse is still amidst the wreckage of the burned barn, and the few remaining villagers are acting strangely, to say the least. As you try to piece together what happened, the mystery takes you on a journey to the top of the mountain. Harkening back to what I said earlier, my love of Mundan has a lot to do with how it made me feel. Gameplay-wise, it's pretty standard fare for an indie horror game. It's sparse, sorta of clunky, lots of notes in environmental storytelling, emphasis on avoiding direct combat, that kind of thing. But despite all that, it plays with light and darkness in increasingly clever ways, creating a vibe or an atmosphere that I find to be very reminiscent of Ari Aster's Midsummer. As you ascend the mountain and explore several big open spaces, it feels like you are descending deeper and deeper into hell, but in a very subtle and unexpected way, as strange as that sounds. As I slowly started to realize what was going on, it started to feel more and more like I had been sucked into a very grim fairy tale. The mechanical elements include a drivable truck that collects hay, basic stat boosts for things like health, sanity, and marksmanship, and some light resource management. So yes, the game is a little light on that front, so if you're not a fan of obtuse environmental puzzles in games like Silent Hill or, to a lesser extent, Resident Evil, this may not be the game for you. But if you're a fan of talking goat heads, feeling watched from afar, or traversing the surreal, then I can't recommend this game enough. Its pencil-drawn art style is reason enough to check it out, but I simply was not ready for the creepy journey this game took me on. It's even available on the Switch now, so literally, what are you waiting for? Halo's journey has been rocky since 343 Industries took the reins from Bungie. While I adored Halo 4 for its character-centric story, Halo 5 was almost completely forgettable for me. Not to mention, I am one of those weirdos who barely touches the multiplayer, so my enjoyment of the series has almost always been derived from the campaigns. 
In 2021, Halo Infinite launched with a few notable features held back for a later update, but luckily for me, a basic bitch, the core single-player campaign arrived fully intact, and it quickly became one of my favorite Halo campaigns, albeit for some maybe unexpected reasons. So hear me out. Brace yourselves. I've said this before, and yes, I know how insane this sounds to a lot of you, but I have never been a huge fan of the way Halo feels. To me, the weapons are largely overrated and unsatisfying, which in turn made me more interested in the lore than anything else, but even that was not always my cup of tea. Halo Infinite won me over by returning to the character-focused drama that made me love 4 so much while improving the weapons across the board and refining the core gameplay into something too sharp to ignore. Don't get me wrong, this game is unapologetically Halo, but on a much grander scale and with a whole arsenal of weapons that I actually enjoyed using. Now, most notably, this is Halo's first foray into open world design. While not on the same scale as your average open world game today, the ring in this game is densely populated with unique terrain, lots of verticality, and intense combat scenarios that breathe new life into the franchise. Of course, this is all just a long-winded way of getting to me saying that this open world Halo game gives you a grappling hook that cracks open the entire combat and traversal dynamic of Halo altogether. In combat, you can use it to pick up weapons, propel yourself across the battlefield, hijack vehicles, or even yank guns right out of the Covenant hands. Outside of combat, it basically makes you Spider-Man, rendering most terrain obstacles obsolete, making every nook and cranny of the world accessible if you have the determination to get there. And I think it speaks volumes that I rarely resorted to using vehicles for traversal in a Halo game, especially one as big and as open as this. It's what we in the biz like to call a game changer. So, if you were at all invested in the Master Chief Cortana relationship from Halo 4 like I was, Infinite finally gets back to that. While I find the smaller, more personal journey to be more interesting than the grander space epic, I certainly appreciate the polish and the presentation of the story as a whole. While much of the deeper Halo lore is beyond my understanding at this point, 343 has done a great job at making me care about Master Chief, and at making me see him as that larger-than-life figure that he's apparently always been to everyone else. And for that reason, Infinite was a perfect storm for me this year. Also, you know, the multiplayer is pretty cool too, for what I played of it. The latest addition to my list this year came during my 2021 cleanup and was played entirely in 2022. This is why we don't do Game of the Year stuff until January, folks. Not only is Unsighted a rock-solid retro throwback, it is also a shockingly competent homage to classic Zelda games like A Link to the Past and even Majora's Mask, with level design that I would say brushes up against goats like Castlevania Symphony of the Night. And for the record, I played that game for the first time in 2021, so I can say things like that now, and it feels good. After Humankind is wiped out during a war with autonomous machines, the remnants of that civilization are running out of life force. You play as Alma, an automaton who sets off to secure a new source of energy and save her people. On the surface, Unsighted looks and feels like a snappy and well-designed love letter to Retro Zelda, but the game shines because of its unique time mechanic. Rather than looping through time a la Majora's Mask, the game instead has you managing not just your own limited life force, but the life force of the other villagers inhabiting the world. Hours can be extended by consuming meteor dust, but that resource is very limited and cleverly hidden throughout the world, forcing you to make tough choices about whether to extend your own life or gift it to others in the hopes of keeping them around longer. But what makes this especially difficult is the fact that the other villagers all exist to provide certain benefits, such as operating a shop, upgrading your weapons, or adding additional chip slots to your loadout. Once they run out of energy, that resource is gone forever. The ship slots in particular are especially important, and failing to manage your meteor dust of supply efficiently can leave you at a disadvantage for the rest of the game, a painful lesson that I unfortunately learned the hard way. Regardless, I persevered, adapted accordingly, and evolved my approach to tackling exploration, dungeons, bosses, etc. Yes, it's stressful, but the game never really backs you into a corner and renders the game unbeatable. Unsighted is a remarkable game that can seem incredibly difficult to broach, but beyond that wall lies one of the most satisfying and rewarding Zelda clones I have played in years. It offers a deeper level of weapon and character customization than most Zeldas, and the addictive world design of a great Metroidvania. It's a game that I, quite honestly, couldn't put down, and one that I find incredibly easy to recommend. If you have ever enjoyed a Zelda game, or felt that pull of an addictive Metroidvania, it's an absolute no-brainer. If you have Game Pass, it's an even easier decision. Speaking of Metroid, one of the biggest surprises of the year turned out to be Metroid Dread, the first original 2D Metroid game since Metroid Zero Mission in 2005. 
not only did it bring 2D style Metroid games back into the limelight in a big way, it did so under the supervision of Mercury Steam, a studio that has a bit of a reputation around these parts for being wildly inconsistent at best and soul crushing at worst. Regardless, the studio proved themselves with the 2D remake of Samus Returns on the 3DS and was then handed the reins of a dormant sequel that never got off the ground in the early 2000s. The odds were certainly against them, but Metroid Dread delivered for me in almost every sense of the word. Samus feels better than ever to control, making traversal through the sectors of Planet ZDR slick and responsive. The modern touches that were introduced in Samus Returns, such as the free aim and melee parry mechanics, make the game feel like a wonderful mix of old and new, and it all coalesces into a game that is a joy to play and hard to put down once you get started. And on top of that, it was released as sort of a premier title for the Switch OLED. Its gorgeous animations, particle effects, and complex 2D environments made great use of color and contrast, which made it a joy to look at as well. In fact, I would call it a highlight of the year for me in terms of visual presentation. It's absolutely beautiful. I love the look of Samus' new suit, and generally speaking, I was a big fan of all the enemy and boss designs as well. Which brings me to the best new element in Metroid Dread, the enemies. These enemies are quick, nimble, and deadly. When you enter one of their zones, they pursue you relentlessly until you're able to finally track down that item that lets you take them down for good. When I was being pursued by an Emmy, it's like the whole vibe of the game had shifted. It's intense and it forces you to be quick to react. It's almost like they're putting their own spin on something like Nemesis or Mr. X from Resident Evil, and in the context of Metroid, it somehow still works. It's like someone injected a little bit of horror into the middle of a Metroid game and it turned out to be a gamble worth taking. All in all, it's impossible to ignore just how fun and nostalgic Metroid Dread is. It's easy to forget that 2D Metroid hasn't been much of a thing since the launch of Metroid Prime, but it somehow feels just as integral and fun today as it did all those years ago. If Metroid Dread is any indication, I hope 2D Metroid is back for the long haul. Man, 2021 was a weird year for me. Not only did several prominent multiplayer games catapult to the top of my list, it was the year that turned me into a Monster Hunter fan. Monster Hunter Rise somehow manages to condense all of the magic, charm, and depth of Monster Hunter World, a game that I admittedly bounced off of several times, into an impressive experience on the Switch. Even more impressive is that it did so while revolutionizing the design through increased verticality and exciting new traversal mechanics which all lend to making this game one of the most fun and addicting games of the year. Now. I've struggled with this series in the past because it felt intimidating or unapproachable, and while Rise certainly doesn't tear those walls down, it does hone those elements and the systems considerably. Enough so that I was able to finally wrap my head around the systems that make Monster Hunter such a hit. I finally understand what it means to fall in love with a specific weapon type, shout out to my beloved Insect Glaive by the way, and then spend hours and hours mastering it by venturing out into different biomes to hunt down any number of intimidating monsters. And let me tell you, as someone who has watched battle footage and listened to Brad rave about this series for years, nothing can quite prepare you for the controlled chaos of a good Monster Hunter fight. It's cliche, but it really is something you need to experience by getting your hands dirty. Pursuing and wailing on an aggressive Rathalos, Anjanath, or my personal favorite, Pookie Pookie, just can't be fully grasped until you've done the legwork yourself. And the satisfaction that you get from the hunt only increases as you master your weapon and the use of the Palamute and Wirebug in combat. And speaking of the Wirebug, I can't imagine playing this series again without it. I still intend to go back and experience Monster Hunter World, but the thought of not being able to zip around the world and the battlefield, like Spider-Man, breaks my heart. It is an absolute game changer, and it makes even the heaviest, chonkiest build feel nimble and maneuverable. And of course, bringing in friends made this not only one of the best multiplayer experiences of the year for me, but probably on the entire platform. I had so much fun playing and streaming this game with the group running around the hub village together, cooking up some tasty treats, and talking strategy before heading out into the world was such a charming and memorable social experience. It was one of those big games that all of us were playing and talking about, which just catapulted this game into my number three slot, and on a bigger note, made it a new highlight of the Switch for me. If Monster Hunter Rise has the impact I think it's going to have on the franchise going forward, I cannot wait to see what comes next. Putting a multiplayer game in my number two slot, or on my list at all, is quite honestly a shock. If you know me, or if you listen to our show, you know that I have a hard time committing to multiplayer experiences, and they rarely stick with me long enough to leave a lasting impression. Enter It Takes Two, the unequivocal shining star of the Hazelight Studios library. You may know them as the team that made Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, or A Way Out, or you may just know them as the team with the fuck the Oscars guy. Well, 
Now, to me, they are the team that absolutely perfected the couch co-op adventure game in 2022. In a world where big screen TVs and projectors are fairly common, the timing couldn't be better for split screen co-op to make a big comeback. And this is it. It Takes Two is the story of two parents on the verge of divorce who are cursed and transformed into dolls and then forced to work together to return to normal and hopefully sort out their issues along the way. All for the sake of their young daughter who is understandably distraught by the whole situation. While it misses the mark in some regards regarding the story, there simply is no denying that the presentation and sheer variety of gameplay is nothing short of fantastic. I played through this game with my wife and we were constantly in awe of how many well-executed ideas made it into this game. Ideas that not only made it fun to play, but gelled with the story and the themes in interesting and at times hilarious ways. I liken it to that feeling of playing a new Mario game and being constantly bombarded with fun and creative mechanics throughout the entire experience. And for those expecting a brief but impactful game like Brothers, It Takes Two is more like a 15 to 20 hour adventure game made up of nothing but pure fun and creativity. But what makes the experience so special is that every level is designed entirely around a dedicated set of mechanics that differ for each player. As the story progresses and you start a new level, you are each beset with a different skill or ability that can be used to either interact with the world or harmonize with your partner to solve puzzles, fight enemies, and traverse the world. A world that is very similar to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or Superland. One level has uh, one person growing and shrinking while the other person can walk on walls and ceilings. Uh, another has you traversing an isometric dungeon-crawling RPG where, the, where one person has ice powers and another has fire powers. And these are just two examples of a huge plethora of fun and engaging mechanics that make every level exciting to play. Mechanically and functionally, everything about It Takes Two is impressive, but the heart of the experience, and the reason why it almost topped my list this year, is the magical experience of sharing it with someone else. In my case, my wife. An avid gamer herself, but someone who often differs from me in terms of gaming preferences. The pull of this game feels so universal, and in the same way most everyone loves Mario, it's a game that's hard to not fall for within minutes of picking it up. It had us constantly laughing and problem solving together, and it sounds cliche, but it really feels like a huge testament to the power and the potential of video games, making it not only one of the best games I played in 2021, but perhaps one of the best multiplayer experiences of my entire life. Rounding out my strange list in such a strange year is Returnal a game that beat me down and pushed me to the limits of my skill and patience for over 50 hours. I'd put it up there alongside games like Sekiro and Souls as one of the most demanding games I've ever played, and like those games, the rewards for perseverance are great and the journey is unforgettable. But what I love about Returnal is that it feels like this love child of several genres that I don't often care for, more specifically bullet hells and roguelikes, melding them with obtuse atmospheric horror writing and birthing something that feels wholly original. The game follows Selene, a space explorer working for the Astra Corporation, who takes it upon herself to investigate a strange signal emanating from an off-limits planet called Atropos. Unfortunately, she crash lands on the planet, and shortly thereafter, she discovers her own corpse in the woods outside her ship. As Selene, you take on this aggressive alien species and you die, and then you wake up back on your ship as it crashes on the planet again. And so the loop begins. The game is Celine's journey to uncover the meaning behind the loop and hopefully find her way back home. That's right, in a year that brought us the likes of Deathloop and the Forgotten City, Returnal was king for me in terms of games dealing with time loops. Much like last year's Hades, it contextualizes the roguelike element in a brilliant way that reinforces the themes and moves the story along with every death. Each time I failed, I became more and more familiar with the strategies and the skills needed to take down the alien aggressors and I became better and better at dodging the endless barrage of colored beams and projectiles. I learned the intricacies of the various weapons and randomized upgrades that make every loop unique. And while that gameplay loop is fast-paced and satisfying, for me it was actually the underlying premise that made it impossible to put down. Housemark really outdid themselves with the world and the fiction of Atropos. It's an overwhelmingly oppressive world that is also undeniably gorgeous and fun to traverse. It's a world that literally begs to be explored and exploited by the player in combat. It's full of beautiful alien scenery, intense light and shadow effects, and an absolutely chilling soundtrack. The story that unfolds for Selene is somewhat abstract, but somewhere around the midpoint of the game, it hit me with perhaps the most devastating plot twist I've seen in years. What follows is this haunting story that revels in the horror of the unknown or the unexplained. In a way, it sort of reminded me of Bloodborne, or any Souls game for that matter, in its general approach to storytelling. 
with squid-like monsters, bizarre alien landscapes, and a ghostly astronaut that guides you through haunting visions of your home back on Earth. This house that manifests itself in the forests of Atropos. It's the kind of science fiction horror that I fucking live for. It's a story that, in a strange way, feels like it's been adapted from some obtuse but wildly successful short horror story, and I mean that as a compliment. But it kept me on the hook for well over 50 hours with some of the best, most demanding mechanics I've ever played with. Also, my final time with the game would seem to suggest that maybe I'm not that great at it. Regardless, making it to the final boss, seeing the credits roll, and then continuing on until you unlock the secret ending, which I did, is what I would consider an accomplishment regardless of skill level. And that's something I think is worth celebrating, and that's why Returnal is without question my favorite game of 2021. Well, there it is. I'm still honestly agonizing over some of the cuts I had to make this year, so much so that I might do a quick 11 through 15 video just to get some of those regrets off my chest. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. Join us in 2022 on 4PlayerNetwork.com for what is looking to be a stellar year in gaming. Cheers.